Right, right. That's right. That's what Aldawa has always been about, democracy. As long as they win, I guess. Yeah. But here's the other thing, though. America's already at war with Iran by way of financial measures, and uh, as Andrew Coburn and um, Brian Ross and Seymour Hersh have reported, covert action inside Iran. Are you worried that uh, something's going to blow up there and the Iranians are going to do something stupid? Mm, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, you know, that, that could happen. Although in, in some ways the standoff with Iran is a little like the, the Cold War with, uh, with Russia. You know, back in the old days, there will be incidents. There have been incidents. You know, they may capture some special forces guy and parade him around Tehran to to prove the perfidy of the great Satan. But while either side would want to exploit incidents, I'm not sure they really want to get into a shooting war with the United States. Well, even I'm pretty as, certain the Iranians don't. The, military is, the one thing you can say is that the Air Force and the and the Navy have not been that severely decimated by the Iraq War because they haven't been that active in it. Right, that's true. So, you know, our our neocons can say, well, you know, we still got the Navy and the Air Force, and that's all we need. Bomb them back to the Stone Age. Yeah, well, and there are some people, too, who say that it's the Air Force who are basically the only ones telling Bush, yeah, it'll be great, while the rest of the military, particularly, I guess, the Army and the Marines, who fear that they're going to have to get stuck cleaning up the mess, so to speak, are the ones opposed. Yeah, that does that does seem to be the case. Strange incentives in the military, you know, you, you advance by being involved in, in, in uh, combat and showing your leadership and your capabilities that way. So that's how you get promoted and get the fast track up toward the top. So the Air Force people are going to want to have more action. Yeah, well, and they have really been left out because they've spent all this time preparing for war with China or something, and Robert Gates has even publicly chastised them. So they need to focus more on how they can be effective in fighting counterinsurgency from the air in mm-hmm. Afghanistan and Iraq. I don't know exactly how that's supposed to work, but apparently F-22 fighters aren't getting the job done. You know, and it is true. When the Cold War ended, it seemed not to affect the whole military procurement situation at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, they were they were still on track to keep on getting, you know, aircraft carriers and, and, and fighter bombers and long-range uh, long-range airplanes, uh, submarines and, and, too. Yeah, and they, so they they just kept on acquiring the same kind of stuff they'd been acquiring all through the Cold War. Yeah, and, the F-22 uh, was designed in like '86 or something, right? Yeah, to celebrate Top Gun's success at the box office, I guess. <laughs> Well, now, tell me this, though, man. Um, There's someone uh, very wise who I talk politics with often who says to me, look, and he's been saying this for years, too, Alan, a president with an approval rating in the low 30s or worse cannot start a war. He just can't. His popularity is too low. He's got no mandate. He's got uh, an election coming up. It would be an absolute disaster. Forget about it. Don't worry about it. It can't be done. What do you say to that? I guess the counter to that is if they really believe, and I think maybe the uh, the Cheney, Elliott, Abrams branch does believe, that it's uh, essential to at least deliver a setback to Iran. You know, they could argue 30% rating, lame duck, what have you got to lose? Yeah, there you go, right? You Cornered know, rat. You will be vindicated by history, which is what Bush really wants to believe anyway, that he's going to be viewed like Harry Truman in another 30 years, and people will see him as the great visionary that he was. You know, the very first article I wrote about this back in 2005, I said at the end there, we ought to consider being really nice to George and not making fun of him too much, because he might see this as the only way out. There's probably something to that. <laughs> So from now on, everybody, I want you to praise George Bush and tell him what a what a great leader he's been and make him feel really good so that he doesn't feel like he's got to do this, his last chance at vindication, starting another war. I could see that in his mind, though. You know, mostly you can see the gears turning in that guy's brain when he's talking. So I could see him figuring that, well, you know, maybe this is a good idea. Oh, I hope not. <laughs> I hope not. Oh, man. So, um... 
William Odom, you bring him up in your article here, the guy who, who died recently. He was Reagan's head of the National Security Agency, called the Iraq War the greatest strategic blunder in American history. What's so important about him, really? Is it is it just that he's a former Reagan guy who criticized this war and proved that you don't have to be a patchouli stinking hippie? Well, I think uh, I, I think that's part of it, but even more than that, and I, I, I got to say, I am grateful that the last time I was in Washington, which was last September, I made it a point to go and visit General Odom because I talked to him on the phone, gosh, no, who knows how many times, mm-hmm. and always enjoyed that. So I, I went, you know, to his office at the Hudson Institute, and we chatted for about an hour, and I think we both enjoyed it. You know, what a intelligent and charming guy he is. But, you know, after after he, uh, you know, took his retirement from the military, he ended up teaching, uh, teaching political science, taking more classes, and he wrote a book called America's Inadvertent Empire that I think is really worth looking at. Uh, if, if, if somebody hasn't done it, he's not entirely against the idea of us having a bit of an empire. But, you know, he says, if you're going to have one, you can't do stupid things like starting wars that are going to predictably put you in a position of occupying a country where most of the people there want to kill you. You know, this is this is not the way to run an empire. Right. Well, I think that's pretty clear. That that seems to really be the uh, emphasis of the Obama campaign, too, is we got to shore this thing up or it's going to fall down. Mm-hmm. We're driving too close to the edge here. we got to scale it back just a little bit so that we can keep it forever. But uh, Bill Odom, he was, to me, he was just an honest guy who called things the way he saw them. And, you know, his pension was safe. He... Uh, he had a nice sinecure at the Hudson Institute, and he didn't have to worry about, uh, you know, whether somebody was going to push him out of a job or not. And it doesn't really take that much courage to do that, but, but in fact, the people that do that are pretty rare. You know, most people sort of stick with the, the tribe they came in with and, you know, don't stick their head up above, uh, above to, you know, for fear that it might get lopped off. And he was a smart and a brave man, I would say. Well, and the Hudson Institute probably doesn't pay nearly as well as if he had gone and gotten a job working for Northrop Grumman or something like that, which is what most retired generals do. Well, probably not. But, uh, you know, he didn't have to worry. But, you know, a lot of people that don't have to worry about their economic future still are conformists and stick with convention and, and uh you know, don't want to stir up any trouble. Yeah, they're worried about their cocktail party future, yeah. not their financial future. And uh, you know, I just I just thought Bill Odom Odom had a lot of integrity, and uh, that's a rarer commodity in the in these United States than than it should be. Yeah. Hey, let me ask you about America's relationship with Russia. You wrote an article a few weeks back called "Moscow Musical Chairs." about the uh, rising to power of the new guys at Medvedev. Is that how you say it? Yeah. And um, Or maybe it's Medvedev, some, something like that. Yeah, well, me and my Russian, you know. Anyway, so uh, what do you think? It seems like uh, American-Russian relations have deteriorated quite a bit. They're supposed to be, I mean, I remember the end of the Cold War and this great new future with us and the Russians. We're going to be friends forever now, and isn't it great that the Cold War is over without ever turning hot and all that kind of thing, and the wall came down, and, and you know, the Scorpions wrote a cheesy song about it, and everybody loved it, and yet it seems like uh, we're not such good friends with the Russians here in 2008. No, although although it's interesting that uh, uh, Bush and Medvedev seem to get along personally at the at the G8 meeting earlier this week, but then you know people can get along personally and still be adversaries. Um, but Does Bush have a Russia policy? Do we have a Russia policy? I don't think we do, except to, except to irritate them from time to time. 